I uh, heard a story about uh, an older couple lived alone, and one morning she's coming down the stairs. She fell. Evidently, she broke her leg. So her husband, he ran to the phone. He dials 911, and he, and he gets the woman on the other end of the, the line, and she's trying to be very helpful to him. And she says, well, just give me your address, and we'll, we'll send an ambulance immediately to come and pick up your wife. He said, well, we live at the corner of Eucalyptus and Chrysanthemum Drive. The woman on the other end of the street said, well, can you spell that, please? There's a long pause. Well, how about if I just drive her down to the corner of Oak and Main and you pick her up there? I think think that it is very important to, as we talk about this, to to know where to go when you need to go to get help. Um, But what's even more important is to know how to get to the true healer, and that's Jesus Christ. And you need to understand that we believe that being baptized is part of the getting to Christ process. And so what I want to do over these next three Wednesday nights is I want to unpack this topic of baptism and why it is such a priority, I believe, for us in Christianity. We believe that we are getting instructions on this topic from none other than the great physician himself, Jesus, because after all, it is the reflection of Jesus we actually see in the water. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that in just a moment, but before I explain to you what Jesus said about baptism, I want to share with you some, a couple of ideas that often we hear about from men when it comes to this topic of baptism. So let's start off with this one. First, write this down. Baptism is important, but it is not necessary. Now those who hold to this view would not doubt the importance or even the necessity of belief or repentance in salvation. They would suggest that it's necessary to believe, that it is necessary to repent. It is good to be baptized, they would say, but it is not necessary. Now, they say this even though you cannot find a single example in the New Testament of an unbaptized Christian. But they have a legitimate concern. Their concern is that we do not violate the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. And that is a very good concern, and it needs to be heard because any teaching of any practice that says salvation by grace through faith is not enough is not biblical. Now, there is another view of baptism that is on the other extreme, and I want you to see this one, write this one down as well. Baptism is necessary because faith is not enough. Now, again, these are good people who have a legitimate concern. They are trying to honor the the many New Testament passages that seem to link baptism to the salvation process. And they tend to conclude that it is God who did his part to make salvation possible. And now man has to come along and do his part to complete the salvation process. So they often talk about salvation as if it is a a series of of steps with, with faith being the very first step that we take and Baptism being one of the last steps that we take. Now, the first group that we talked about, they'll go to Ephesians chapter 2 for ammunition, and they'll say, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. Well, this second group that we were talking about, they will go to James chapter 2, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, both groups have a legitimate concern. Both groups say some things that are very right, but I think both views are wrong. Let me show you why. Next, next week, as we look into this, we're going to examine other passages in the epistles about baptism, but today I'm just going to stick to what Jesus said in the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 3, This is, in my judgment, one of the most important passages on the topic of baptism in the Bible, but it's probably the least noticed. So from your own Bible, Matthew 3, beginning in the 13th verse, read these words along with me. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. 
But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I love and I am well pleased with him. Now, the first thing that is very obvious and when you look at John or Matthew chapter 3 is that when Jesus came to be baptized, John was very surprised because a few verses earlier, John had been telling the crowd that Jesus is going to become and he's going to be a baptizer, not a recipient. John was out there baptizing for the forgiveness of sins and Jesus had no sins to be forgiven of. So why did Jesus insist on being baptized? Well, here are some possible answers to that question. Write these down. Number one, to validate John's ministry. Later, Jesus would say to the Pharisees, were you baptized by John? Because John's baptism was proof he was a prophet of God. Another reason that Jesus was baptized was, I believe, to identify with humanity. He, he came to take our place. Even though he was not a sinner, he came to walk in the steps of sinners and bear their penalty. I think one reason that Jesus was baptized was to comply with his destiny. In other words, by being baptized, Jesus was showing that, that his life was, was headed to the cross. It was a preview of his death. And Jesus often used baptism as a metaphor for death. Luke chapter 12, verse 50. Jesus said, but I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed I am until it is completed. And then there's a passage out of Mark chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other one sit at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? So when Jesus spoke of baptism, he was often speaking of Death, And so by being baptized, he was demonstrating his willingness to accept this very costly mission that God had given to him. It was, in a sense, the beginning of his death. It was the beginning of his emptying himself unto death, as Paul describes in Philippians 2. Now, all of these reasons could be part of the answer, but I'll tell you the bottom line is this. Jesus was baptized to obey God. Because he said to John, go back to Matthew 3, the passage we looked at, verse 15. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus had to do what was right. And what was right was to obey God by seeking out John and to be baptized. And the text makes it very clear that God was extremely pleased with what Jesus did. And when you're going to talk about the role of baptism and its importance, you've got to start, I believe, right there. That behind every single believer's baptism is the baptism of Jesus. Now turn over to Matthew chapter 28. This is a very familiar passage of scripture. This is, this is Jesus' last marching orders to the church. Matthew 28, we're going to pick it up in verse 18. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, these are the very last words of Jesus to the church that Matthew was writing to. And I think it is significant that at the start of the gospel, we see Jesus begin his ministry by being baptized. And at the end of his ministry, he is telling his disciples to go and baptize others all over the world 
into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And into the name was a technical term lifted right out of the world of commerce in Jesus' day. It literally meant to enter into an account. So in other words, Jesus is saying that a person is united with the triune God in an ownership relationship. At baptism, you come under new management. So baptizing was an indispensable part of the final marching orders of Jesus of the making disciples process. Now let's just take a second and reflect on on these two passages that we have looked at so far. It seems to me that that they would challenge the view that baptism is important, but it's not necessary. We have the example of Jesus being baptized to do what is right, and we have the command of Jesus to baptize in order to make disciples. Now, how could the example of Jesus and the command of Jesus be an option for a believer? Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, You will obey what I command. Obeying God is always necessary. Somebody might be thinking, well, see, we knew that first view was wrong. Baptism is necessary because faith is not enough. Well, I didn't say that either. And I want to keep reading because I want to have you look at another passage out of Mark chapter 16. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. And it says this. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That word good news is where we get the word gospel from. And I want to make a point right here that we, we need to distinguish between the gospel and baptism because I have people tell me, when are we going to have more gospel sermons and what their meaning is? When am I going to be preaching more sermons on baptism? And baptism is is good news, um, but it is not the good news. Baptism is how we respond once we understand the good news. I think it is significant that in this particular text, after people have heard the good news, Jesus expects a response. Jesus expects a response of faith and baptism. Notice how he connects them. The grammatical construction would not allow you to claim that that either one, baptism or belief, is more important than the other. The, The fact is the idea that the efficacy of baptism presupposes the presence of faith. If you look at the negative clause right after this, in the last half of Mark 16, verse 16, he points out that if you don't believe, you aren't going to bother with getting baptized. In other words, you are either going to do both of them, believe and be baptized, or you're not going to do either of them. You see, there is no suggestion here that baptism is an additional step that is added to faith. The idea is that baptism is the visible expression of faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that every gift of grace that is promised to faith in the New Testament is also promised to baptism? That's because these two ideas are so closely linked in the New Testament. By the way, I think this passage really shows us something about the essence of of baptism. It's really more about promise than it is about command. It's not so much God commanding you to do something, it is God promising to do something when you obey him. Now look over in John chapter 3. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, a very religious man, and it's nighttime. Jesus is with Nick at night. John 3, verse 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Now, one thing we are going to see as we study baptism is a close connection to 
to the Holy Spirit in this process. John promised that Jesus would come and baptize in the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus was baptized, the, the Holy Spirit descended. Jesus talks about a water spirit birth. Peter preached at Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, he said in Acts 2, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul taught in Titus that we are saved by the washing and the uh, rebirth and renewal through the Holy Spirit. The reason that is important is because I want you to understand that the Bible never says that what you really need to straighten up your life is a little religion. What you need is regeneration. There was a movie that some of you will probably remember back in the day. It was called City Slickers. It was about these three buddies from New York City and their lives were going nowhere fast and, and they were disenchanted. They were frustrated. So they decided they were going to take a vacation and they were going to go into the old West and do a cattle drive to see if they can find themselves. And there was a poignant scene in that movie where one of the guys whose life really was in the pit was talking to his friends. He said, you remember when we were boys and we played stickball and if you swung and you missed, you could shout do over. He asked the question, you think life can be a do-over? What Jesus is saying to this extremely religious man is you don't need a little more spit and polish. You need a do-over. You need to start all over. You need to be born again. To be recreated on the inside by the Spirit. And this recreation, this new creation process, Jesus said, is initiated by what he called a water spirit birth. And I want you to notice one more time how he connects this water spirit birth to faith. Because just a few verses later, look at what he says in John 3, verse 9 is where I'm going to pick it up. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, we testify to what we have seen, but still you people don't accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Now remember just... just a few verses earlier, he says that you have to be born of water and of spirit to enter the kingdom of God. And if you're not born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And a few verses later, he says, you've got to believe to be saved. And if you don't believe, you are condemned. Jesus is connecting water, spirit, birth to faith. So I, I ask the question, is baptism according to Jesus, a work that must be added to the faith that we have in the gospel? I believe the answer is a resounding no. Baptism is a faith response to the gospel. Nowhere in the New Testament, not one place, does the word work ever get associated with baptism. Now, the New Testament talks a lot about works, but never once does it use the word baptism in relationship to that. Now, it doesn't mean that we must not do something. It is reasonable to understand that men must do something to be saved. Otherwise, all men would be saved. And we know that all men are not saved. In fact, I'll go a step further. I would say this. Men must do a work to be saved. And I'm going to show you what I believe in that. 
from John chapter 6. Look at verses 28 and 29. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. We must do something to receive God's gracious offer of salvation, but whatever we do must in no way be seen as earning our salvation. By grace through faith teaches human responsibility without in any way suggesting that God could then be obligated. And Jesus says that baptism is one way that faith is manifested or made visible. Baptism is an expression of my faith in the gospel, not an addition to it. That's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, having been buried with him in baptism. And raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Let me give you a really clear illustration of that from Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas had been in prison. God heard their prayers while they were in prison and an earthquake releases them, but they didn't run away and the jailer could not believe it. And it says in Acts 16, the jailer called for lights, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, listen very clearly. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I've heard people preach on this and I've actually heard preachers say from the pulpit. Now, it really is not that simple. (laughs) After the Apostle Paul just used those words. That is absolutely wrong. Paul and Silas simply answered the question they were asked. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. That was his answer. You don't need to add to that. But sometimes you can illuminate on that to help people understand it. So it says in Acts 16, as it continues, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. And to all the others in his house, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. See, they didn't believe and then get baptized to add to it. They were baptized because they believed. They were baptized to express their believing. They believed and they were saved. Baptism isn't about you doing something. It is about you seeing by faith what Christ has already done. It is Jesus that is reflected in the water. That's why baptism has so much to say. In fact, let me show you three things that baptism says about Jesus. Write this one down. Baptism says the gospel is true because Jesus is God. There is nothing that preaches the gospel more powerfully than baptism. What is the gospel? Well, look with me at the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 15. Beginning in verse 1, Paul writes these words. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Listen, this is the heart of the gospel right here, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried That he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. You know, let me tell you something about what I think the devil thinks about my preaching. I think the devil could tolerate a lot of my preaching. I think I could preach for the rest of my life on how to have a good family and do well in your relationships and How to earn money according to biblical principles. And I think the devil would tolerate a lot of that. He could tolerate every sermon I ever preach as long as I never mention the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. 
but baptism will not let you forget that message. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism powerfully reflects the saving work of the Son of God. I probably shouldn't do this, but let me just be honest. When we have a baptism on a Sunday morning, somebody decides they want to give their life to Christ and and be baptized, and we go up, And people leave, that really ticks me off. It burns my cookies good. You see, those folks are reliving the gospel in baptism. And I I just can't understand another person who calls himself or herself a Christian that would have anything literally more important than staying and watching a gospel be preached all over again. That is what baptism does. It, It preaches the gospel. Second, write this down. Salvation is free because Jesus is Savior. Let's go back to that verse we looked at earlier in Ephesians chapter 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works. So that no one can boast. And I, I ask you in light of everything that we have said at this point. Does baptism contradict Ephesians 2? I want to tell you, baptism endorses this verse. Have you ever considered how passive a person is in baptism? They don't do anything. It's all done to them. In biblical baptism, Jesus is the actor. He is doing the baptizing, just like John promised. He is pouring out the Spirit. You are not doing anything. You are receiving. Nothing is earned. Everything is given. And when I baptize people, often they're very nervous and they'll ask me the question, what, what do I do? And I just, I just simply tell them, well, you bend your knees and I'll do the rest. And, and I would tell you that is exactly God's answer when you ask the question, what, what do I do to get saved? Just bend your knees and let God do the rest. When you are baptized, that is what you are doing. You are are declaring that you are not trusting in your own efforts for salvation. You You are content to just rest in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. It is it is your willing plunge into the promise and power of Christ. Finally, write this one down. Discipleship is daily because Jesus is Lord. Remember I said that Jesus would would think of death when he would use the word baptism. Jesus made it clear that if you're going to follow him, you are going to find life only through death. He says in Luke 9, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so like Jesus, when I am baptized, I am accepting my own mission from God to carry a cross. It is my pledge to live by God's agenda, not my own. I don't get baptized every day, but I have to renew that pledge every single day. And the best I can explain that is this. Martin Luther had somebody that came to him once and It said, Martin, how come after I have been baptized, I still struggle with sin? And Luther said, that's because the old Adam is a mighty good swimmer. I don't believe that baptism is a one-time response. I believe that baptism is the beginning of a lifetime of responding. Augustine, who we call Saint Augustine, was a very immoral young man before he found Jesus. And after he became a Christian, he was walking down the streets of Milan and a prostitute with whom he had had relations with recognized him. He walked right past her and she assumed that he didn't recognize her. And so she called out and said, Augustine, it is I. And he stopped. He didn't even turn around. 
He said, yes, but it is no longer I. You see, he had a new birth. That's what Paul means when he wrote to the church in Galatia, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I remember coming across a story once by a a Christian businessman that was trying to sell a warehouse that had not been used for several years. It was in very poor shape. Vandals had, had put graffiti on the walls, broken out windows, trash was strewn throughout the building. And he had a prospective buyer looking at the building with him in this empty warehouse, and he was showing it, and he was making promises to him as he walked through. He said, I'm going to clean this up. I'm going to get that taken care of. But the buyer said, you know what? That's really not necessary. I'm not interested in the property. I just want the site. And I would tell you that that is exactly what God says to us. God doesn't want to take an old building and, and try to clean it up a little bit. He wants to tear it down, and he wants to to begin a new construction through the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want the building. He wants the site. So so what do you do with that old building? The best thing that I know what you do with it is you bury it, and you let Jesus raise up something that is all new. And when that happens, you truly become a reflection of Jesus. Jesus. 